All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for, for coming back to join us uh, for what promises to be uh, an electric discussion of uh, the geopolitical aspects of the situation around Ukraine, um, all of which, of course, uh, are on the backdrop of the very, very fresh, uh, not even uh, dry agreement uh, from Minsk uh, about, we hope, moving this conflict into a more peaceful phase so that some of the ambitions that Mustafa talks about and which he represents um, can actually be achieved. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, uh, let me just note, uh, you may have seen this during the coffee break. It'll be available as we head into the reception. Of course, everyone is invited to the reception just across the way uh, at 5 o'clock, uh, assuming we conclude the panel on time. But there's an, uh, an exhibition of political cartoons uh, having to do with uh, the history of uh, uh, relations uh, with Russia and in Eastern and Central Europe. Um, I commend them to you. They're, they're quite an interesting slice of history, so thanks to the, the Ratius for that. Um, and related to that, on the, on the theme of artwork, uh, I want to note for uh, all of you here and listening online uh, that uh, next week we are very lucky to be able to open an exhibit that flows directly from Mustafa's uh, efforts at spear, uh, spearheading the Maidan, and that is uh, the visual aspect of the Maidan. It's uh, going to be a display of nearly 40 works of art by prominent Ukrainians, uh, including folks like Andrei Yamolenko, uh, uh, Marian Luniv, Elena Holub, and others. Uh, the artwork that was created in and around the Maidan, as we know, not everything about the Maidan was shouting and fighting. There was, there was a, a lot of time that was about uh, peaceful protest and expression. And uh, so we will have a selection of those works here at the Wilson Center. Uh, they'll be on display from uh, 9 to 5 every day from February 18th to March 18th. And I want to invite everyone to join us on February 18th at 5 o'clock for an opening reception where we'll have the curator of the exhibit coming in from Kiev, Natalia Musienko. Uh, and I'm very grateful to uh, the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, uh, the Ukrainian Embassy, uh, to the Fulbright program, Mari, and the other private donors who've made this exhibition possible. So please, please join us and uh, enjoy, you know, at least one aspect of this story that is, uh, I think, uplifting and also fascinating. So uh, that is the preface. Let me now uh, come to our fantastic panel. In addition to Mustafa, who, if he needed no introduction before, needs even less so now, I think uh, he, he is deeply acquainted to, to all of you now and, and his uh, insightful thoughts about the situation. We'll have uh, additional comments first from Angela Stent, uh, who's director for the Center of, uh, for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies series at Georgetown. Uh, she's also a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings, where she co-chairs the uh, Hewitt Forum on Post-Soviet Affairs and previously served as National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia for the National Intelligence Council. Uh, her most recent, among many books, is The Limits of Partnership, U.S.-Russia Relations in the 21st Century. So, Angela, why don't you go ahead? I know you have to leave a little bit early, and then I'll introduce the, the other panelists. Thank you very much, Matt. Congratulations, Mustafa, on receiving the uh, Ratsu Award. Thank you for inviting me back, Kennan Institute and Wilson Center. I remember four years ago being on a panel with Alia Kozlovsky and Mike Mafal, actually, discussing a number of issues about Russian democracy, and it certainly hasn't gotten any better since then. Um, I was asked to talk about Russian policy towards Ukraine, so I'm going to be the bad guy on this panel. Um, but I did want to preface my remarks by just saying that I'm talking about the policies of the Russian state, and that there are Russians, and I know them, <laughs> who support the Euromaidan, who are opposed to the war uh, with Ukraine. They're Russian journalists, and I know that you know them, who've moved from Moscow and live in Kiev, because there they can broadcast broadcast freely, they have freedom of speech, um, and getting away from the media environment where they are really uh, repressed. So again, I'm going to talk about the views of the Russian state. I understand there are uh, others in Russia who have uh, different views towards Ukraine. Um, so I wanted to give a very brief historical explanation because I think you can only understand what's happened in the last year in the context of at least what's happened in the last 22 years, or you could go back a few hundred years. Um, a very complex relationship 
always uh, between Russia and Ukraine, involving core issues of national identity and very different narratives about the past. And you can go back to the 12th century, you can go back to the 17th century, you can go back to different periods of the 20th century, but again, the, the you know fundamental differences uh, in interpreting um, what happened in history. Um, Many Russians have historically not regarded Ukrainians as a separate national group. Uh, and since the collapse of the Soviet Union, many in Russia do not regard the Ukrainian state as a separate state. Uh, they've had great difficulty coming to grips with this, and many of them, I would argue, still have not. Um, just one anecdote, in 1994, in January, when President Bill Clinton uh, met with President Kravchuk and President Yeltsin to sign the tripartite agreement uh, whereby Ukraine agreed to give up its nuclear weapons, he had to use all of his powers of persuasion, and President Clinton obviously has great powers of persuasion, uh, to get President Yeltsin to sign an agreement because that implied that he was actually signing an agreement with a separate state, Ukraine. Uh, and this was unprecedented in Russian history. Um, now, for the rest of the 1990s, I would say there were a lot of tensions in Ukrainian-Russian relationships. There were difficult negotiations over things like the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. Uh, there were numerous calls from the Duma during that period to annex that Crimea should join Russia. Um, so there was a lot of tension, but agreements were signed. However difficult it was, a modest vivendi was worked out between Russia and Ukraine, um, which functioned reasonably well. The current situation, I would argue, dates back, you know, to the Orange Revolution. I think you can only understand, again, what Russia has done uh, since November of, of 2013. If you go back to the Orange Revolution, the shock after all the uh, resources that Russia had invested in making sure that Yanukovych got elected, uh, to just only to see um, his election turned over. And the narrative about what happened then is very similar in Russian terms of what you hear now. So for that Maidan, again, Russian commentators, the media, although they were freer then, but the, the mainstream media all said that it was the United States and its special services that were responsible for the Maidan um, uh, demonstrations then. I remember being on a panel um, shortly thereafter with Sergei Markov, who's still saying the same things, only in a more extreme way, in Russia, where he said to me, the CIA paid every demonstrator on the Maidan $10 a day to go out and demonstrate. So, and you know, you hear claims like that still, and what happened in the Euromaidan. So, um, uh, so this has been a constant. Um, and I think the real shock then, and it was a problem then, and it's been a problem um, since the beginning of the Euromaidan, and we already heard Mustafa uh, talk about this, is that for the current Russian system, the current regime, um, Ukraine is really very much a domestic issue because a successful uh, Maidan or Euromaidan that brings to power a government that will eventually do all of the things that Mustafa and his colleagues would like them to do becomes uh, a, a democracy with a rule of law uh, and a, a society like that. That's a huge threat to the Putin system. So, um, so the view of Ukraine is partly or largely in many ways through a domestic filter for the current regime in Moscow. Um, now, I would also say, however, that what's happened in Ukraine and what's been happening for some time is also very much part of uh, Russia's, the, the Russian imperial project, whatever we want to call it, neo-Soviet project. So from Putin's worldview, um, looking out in the world, today Russia certainly believes that it's at war with the West, not just at war with Ukraine, it's at war with the West, and Ukraine is the symbol of that um, because uh, this, from the, from the Russian point of view, should be, Ukraine must be part of its sphere of privileged interests. We've already heard that, but I think I, I want to emphasize again that that's very much the way that the, the people in the Kremlin view the world, that Russia has the right to this legitimate sphere of influence, and what you have today is the enunciation of the you know, 2014, 2015 version of the Brezhnev Doctrine. So it's maybe the Putin Doctrine of limited sovereignty, that a country like Ukraine and others post-Soviet states should don't have the right to full sovereignty, uh, that they in fact have limited sovereignty. And Putin has said that in many ways, and that's an essential part of the way that Russia views 
the war with the West and the relationship with Ukraine. And then the other part of that, um, which we've heard much more about since the annexation of Crimea, is the Ruski Mir. So the idea of the Russian world, of the injustice that was done to Russians and Russian speakers after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that they didn't all live within Russia's borders, that they can feel threatened by living um, in a non-Russian state, and that Russia has a sacred right to defend them. You heard that in Putin's speech after the annexation of Crimea. You've heard it since then. So the Ruski Mir concept is, a, a, again, very much part of the way that Russia views Ukraine being part of this world, and Russia then using the justification for defending uh, its citizens who feel threatened, even though, of course, in the same token, by the same token saying that, of course, it doesn't have any troops in Ukraine. Um, and we must remember, when we listen to all of this and we try and understand Putin's worldview and what's happening now, there is no precedent in history for any Russian government, be it imperial, Soviet, or whatever, to give up its empire for any length of time. So obviously there have been periods in Russian history uh, and Soviet history when uh, Russia has lost territories, but gradually it's recouped them. And there has not been um, a willingness and ability in the past 22 years uh, for people in the, the people in the Russian political system to accept that the Soviet, now we can call it empire, has gone to accept that and move on to something else. That's not there. All you hear when you listen uh, to what's said, when you read what, uh, what has uh, been written, is this nostalgia nostalgia for the past, the sense of Russian victimhood that this was taken away from Russia. So this, the fact that there's no historical precedent for acceptance of the loss of empire is something that we are still living with. Um, so where are we now? Um, I'm myself um, uh, not to, I mean, I'm rather skeptical about this latest ceasefire, uh, just because I know what happened um, uh, at the, you know, after the last Minsk agreement was signed. Not too much. <laughs> um, I do, and I do believe that you know, even though Russia has suffered, you know, quite badly from all of the financial sanctions, particularly never mind uh, the fall in the price of oil and all of the other systemic economic problems in Russia that stem from the mismanagement of the system. So far, this really hasn't caused Russia uh, to change its policies in Ukraine, which I believe still remain to make it impossible or very difficult for the current government in Kiev to function to make it impossible for it to establish control over all of its territory, and eventually hoping uh, that this government will fall and will give way to a government in Kiev that um, is not going to be interested in this Euro-Atlantic integration that obviously is very important to the current government. Today in the New York Times, there's a big article suddenly about Mr. Medvedchuk, who was at the uh, negotiations apparently, and about how he, you know, he'd be the ideal candidate from Moscow's point of view. But I think we have to understand the Russian goal at the moment is not to have a settlement <coughs> where Ukraine um, establishes its control over its territory and moves forward uh, with closer Euro-Atlantic integration. Um, and, you know, I hope that the ceasefire lasts. It's terrible, the devastation and the deaths that have happened in eastern Ukraine, but I think one has to be uh, rather skeptical about that. Um, and I think um, what I will do is, you know, my final point is to, to ask how could this change? Um, because you have attitudes in Russia that are very deeply ingrained. I agree completely with Oleg Kozlovsky, and that's certainly my experience of the younger generation. Um, we all hope, we always hope that the younger generation will do something different and better, and sometimes they do, and we certainly hope that they do in Ukraine, and we see that already. But in Russia, you have many of the kind of elite generation, at least of the younger people, whose attitudes are as Soviet, if not more so, than maybe their parents, um, and who really believe that Russia was victimized, humiliated, and that Russia must restore uh, its greatness through the control um, of its contiguous territories. So I think um, I would end by saying that if we're waiting for change from the Russian point of view, it's generational change, but it also has to be in the end systemic change, because without that systemic change, um, I don't think you'll get the kind of generational change that we would hope for. Thank you very much, Angela. That was a that was a, a very good, I think, uh, foreign policy elucidation of the points that uh, that, that uh, Oleg Kozlovsky made in the previous panel. Um, we'll go next, actually, to Ambassador Miller. Uh, Ambassador William Miller is a senior policy scholar here at the Wilson Center, associated with our Kennan Institute. Uh, he was ambassador to Ukraine from 1993 to 1998. He also served in the U.S. embassies in Tehran and in the consulate in Isfahan. 
uh, in the 1950s and 60s and spent uh, a decade and a half on Capitol Hill where he was staff director for three different Senate committees including the Select Committee on Intelligence. He's taught at Harvard University, at Tufts, and at Johns Hopkins SICE and is widely published on U.S.-Russian, U.S.-Iran relations uh, and has been the president of the American Committee on U.S.-Soviet Relations. Ambassador Miller. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here with such uh, distinguished people as Mustafa, <clears throat> and uh, he has given a sense of the Maidan and the quality of the people from the Maidan. And uh, in uh, many respects, uh, I base my remarks on the optimism that they will take charge eventually, and I hope uh, rapidly. But I'd, I would like to uh, refer to the legal framework of this dispute <clears throat> between uh, Russia and all of Europe and much of the world, not to mention Ukraine. The framework of understanding for the peace in Europe after the Cold War was uh, established in 1975 with the Hel Helsinki Final Act. And as uh, scholars and diplomats well know, uh, the Soviets were very much behind the uh, Helsinki Final Act. Uh, and very supportive because uh, one uh, important element of it was the uh, territorial integrity of the states uh, that would be signatory. So that's the father of uh, all subsequent agreements on the post-war, post-Cold War understanding. I take very seriously Gorbachev's warning at the uh, Berlin Wall ceremonies just a month ago where he said we're on the brink of a new Cold War. I think uh, all the evidence is there. Warfare is under, is taking place. Subversion, covert action, the destabilization of a, of a, an allied nation uh, and uh, the active uh, attempt to uh, uh, bring a nation under its control. I was a witness to the agreements in Moscow, the trilateral agreement. I saw the treatment of uh, uh, by Yeltsin of Kravchuk that uh, Angela has referred to. But uh, I also un understand fully the background. The purpose of the uh, agreement was to eliminate all nuclear weapons from Ukraine, the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world and uh, a great uh, cause of concern for all civilized nations uh, about its disposition. That was the core of the concern. Uh, Ukraine viewed its nuclear arsenal as a successor state, as a deterrent to possible future aggression from the north, from Moscow. And they were very explicit in their discussions with us and the other Western nations ab about that fear. Uh, they agreed to give up nuclear weapons in return for, and I quote here, that the nations will deal with each other as full and equal partners and that their relations 
will be conducted on the basis of respect for the, quote, independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of each nation. Uh, this is the language that comes from the Helsinki Final Act. It's uh, also the language in the Budapest Mem Memorandum, and it was uh, the heart of the uh, uh, now forgotten Charter of Paris of 1990, in which uh, all of the leaders of the Western world <laughs> signed with Gorbachev a solemn agreement to undertake to preserve the territorial integrity of every nation. So what has happened is a, a direct affront and violation of agreements entered into by, by Russia. Uh, the question that uh, Gorbachev posed was basically that uh, the understanding in 1990 has not been lived up to, that uh, the uh, st structures of the Cold War, military structures, did not wither away, particularly NATO. Uh, Warsaw Pact withered away and the uh, feeling on the part of Russia was that uh, it was diddled, basically, that uh, the agreement was not fully implemented, although uh, I, I am witness to efforts of inclusion that NATO has made repeatedly over the years uh, to include uh, Russia in the equation, the European equation. But certainly the vision of 1990 in which all of the nations uh, west of the Urals would live at peace in, and in prosperity has not been realized. And uh, the, we, we are all well aware of the reasons why. But uh, we're confronted with uh, a conscious violation of solemn agreements entered into by Russia. And what do we do about it? What do the Russians do about it? What, what, does the, what is the significance of this trashing of the European order? of peace and possibility. I think the uh, actions of uh, uh, Russia over the past decade uh, in the near or abroad, certainly in Georgia, Ossetia, not to mention Chechnya, Dagestan, uh, an earlier uh, creation of an independent republic of Crimea in 1994, you will remember that occasion, where uh, a puppet government was set up following the exact same playbook that we've just witnessed, uh, and a government uh, was put in place under Yuri Meshkov uh, that lasted almost a year. President Clinton and uh, Yeltsin met mightily on this question and uh, all of us down the line, uh, including me in Crimea with Yuri Meshkov directly. And uh, Clinton persuaded Yeltsin to withdraw support and it the independent coll collapse, the independent republic collapse. And we went to uh, a return to the territorial integrity of Ukraine. 
so we're faced with uh, a uh, five-year period in which uh, covert action has been undertaken against Ukraine. Uh, two ministers of defense were holders of Russian passports. The head of intelligence was a, a Russian agent. If that's not subversion, then I don't know the definition of the word. It's, it's certainly uh, examples of uh, a, an action at a series of actions that are aimed at destabilizing a nation, bringing it under control of uh, Moscow, and what do we do about it? We're faced with uh, little green men, uh, proxy uh, mercenaries, uh, discontented uh, groups in uh, eastern Ukraine who believe they have a mission. Uh, and we have, uh, at a minimum, uh, a, a terribly destructive war uh, that's uh, cost thousands of lives, hundreds of thousands of displaced persons, perhaps millions, and the destruction of industry and commerce, uh, hardly uh, the actions of a uh, ally and friend. So what do we do about it? It seems to me that we're confronted with uh, a terrible dilemma, D a huge uh, foreign policy question that uh, affects the peace of Europe and the uh, world order. The United Nations Charter, I don't need to remind you, is based on uh, uh, comity among nations and a peaceful settlement of disputes. Uh, we have to return to that. And uh, obviously, the negotiations of the kind that are ongoing in Minsk and the efforts of the OSCE are uh, steps in the right direction and ultimately we will have to have a negotiated settlement but it, in my view it cannot be anything of, uh, but on the basis of the territorial integrity of Ukraine that includes Crimea and uh, anything short of that is unacceptable and uh, it is my position that uh, the United States should support uh, Ukraine as it is obliged to do by uh, agreements uh, ex ex written over and a, a carried out over a period of over 20 years. And uh, we should supply the military equipment necessary for Ukraine to defend itself from invasion. Uh, we all know that uh, the Russian military is far superior to uh, that of Ukraine. Uh, it's a much larger nation. It's the largest nation on earth, but it's also a civilized nation and is capable of uh, a peaceful outcome that uh, enables it to live at peace with its neighbor that has a right to uh, to nationhood, particularly under the uh, uh, leadership of the uh, Maidan generation, uh, which has proved itself both uh, in principle and in practice and in, in, in sacrifice of lives and, uh, uh, and treasure. Uh, it is my hope that uh, the United States will extend a full support to Ukraine uh, in every way. I think we're committed to do it. 
and, and that includes uh, extensive financial assistance because it's a shattered economy uh, because of the war and uh, because of corruption, which uh, Mustafa will clean up. Um, and uh, that's the best outcome and the only rational outcome uh, given the experience that we've had in the 20th century with wars, revolutions, and uh, virtual uh, self-destruction. We have a chance to have a civilized outcome and Ukraine uh, should be the model of dealing with uh, war and misunderstanding. Thank you. Uh, so our next, our next speaker is uh, Constanza Stelson Miller, who's currently the Robert Bosch Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. She was uh, not long ago the Senior Transatlantic <laughs> Fellow with the German Marshall Fund. Uh, where she directed the Transatlantic Trends Survey Program, uh, among other projects. She's also former director of GMF's office in Berlin. Uh, and from 1994 to 2005, she was editor for the political section of the German weekly Die Zeit. Uh, she's been a fellow at Grinnell College in Iowa, uh, a Woodrow Wilson Center public policy scholar, I'm happy to say, uh, and a member of the Remark Forum. Uh, and her essays and articles uh, in both German and English are widely published uh, and widely appreciated. Constanza, the floor is yours. Thank you. Do I have to hit something here, or does nope, this is this self-starting? Okay. All right. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, it's nice to be back at the Wilson Center. It's not the first time since my three-month uh, stint here ten years ago, but uh, nonetheless, it's always a pleasure. And of course, the subject of Ukraine has become. Well, any of us who who are uh, who work on the foreign and security policy um, of Europe uh, and, and the issues there, it is what keeps us uh, working during the day and up at night, and it fuels our nightmares as well. So I have the feeling that I have been talking about this nonstop for actually really the last couple of months. There's almost nothing else I do these days. I've uh, become. Um, it, it reminds me of of something uh, the. State Secretary in the in the German Foreign Ministry, I was told by a friend of mine, apparently said at one meeting, um, sometimes these days I have the feeling I'm running a Ukraine ministry, uh, and and that is sometimes what my my job has been feeling like these days to me. Um, it has become almost an obsession for anybody who does who in, in as a German works works on these issues. Um, which is interesting in itself because it shows you the degree to which um, German perception of their foreign policy responsibilities have shifted. Um, I have just come back from Munich. Uh, I was came back on Monday. I, I was there for uh, all the eruptions that you have heard about. I don't need to cite them. The McCain eruptions, the Graham eruptions, the Corker eruptions, and all the other eruptions. That apparently, I was told yesterday by a couple more that happened offline say, at, at meetings uh, with the CODEL and, and German CEOs. Uh, and in other words, um, the weekend uh, was, and, and you know, the, f the, the truth is this is always the case for Munich security conferences. It's a fest for the terrible simplifiers, the terrible simplificateur. Um, <laughs> and you will have people on all sides uh, grandstanding uh, whenever they see a, a microphone in sight. Um, and very often you have to ask yourselves, um, whether they may not have a domestic reason to do so, I would remind us all that um, Mr. McCain is facing a, a re-election campaign in, uh, in Arizona where he is facing a significant Tea Party challenge. I won't say, knowing McCain and knowing his staffers, that's not the only reason why he would say these things, but I would <laughs> say it helps. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the, the, the German TV public that, that watches him erupt uh, in front of a, tea camera, a TV camera usually doesn't know this. Um, and so the result is that, and as is often the case in these, in these tragic policy uh, situations where you have no good choices and a host of bad choices, uh, you will have the people who, who enjoy the simplifying um, take center stage, and that unfortunately obscures some of the nuance and the terrible urgency of, of the, 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 the decisions to be made. 
Um, so Munich, I think, was moderately productive, but not terribly. Um, let me try and and set the set the stage or or describe to you where I think Germany is at at this point um, to uh, calm things down a little bit uh, and give you a sense of what uh, what the thinking is in Berlin. I just spent two weeks there and in fact made the rounds of the Chancery, the Foreign Ministry, and the Defense Ministry, and I, and I think I have a reasonably good thing a good sense of of where things are. Um, as you know, the uh, Germany had until quite recently, a very close relationship with Russia. In fact, it was termed a strategic relationship, something that was always noted by critics here. Uh, that term in itself was somewhat overstated uh, because strategic relationship is really the, the sticker for everything um, that, for every important relationship that Germany has. Um, it becomes slightly less impressive when you know it's also applied to Germany's relationship with Vietnam. Mm. Um, it's also true that Germany exports uh, about a third, 36 to 39 percent, depending on how you count, uh, of its oil and gas imports uh, from, from Russia. Um, it is also true that there is a powerful Eastern Committee, the Ostausschuss of the German Federation of Industries, the BDI, uh, which uh, is composed both of uh, DAX companies and of Mittelstand companies, small and medium-sized companies, who have important interests in Russia and who, uh, who say that up to 200,000 jobs at any given point are jeopardized by spats in the German-Russian relationship. Um, but the reality is that all of that has been either, or let me add one other thing, and there is, of course, this, the Social Democrats' affection for Ostpolitik. Uh, the, this is a term invented by Egon Barr, uh, the still uh, uh, with us, nonagenarian by now, um, if, uh, great defense intellectual of the Social Democratic Party, advisor to Willy Brandt, and who, and who coined this as the term for a policy of rapprochement towards Eastern Germany and uh, what was then the Warsaw Pact. Um, there are, of course, the, uh, also, there's, there's still people to hold fast to all that. There are still people who think we ought to have a strategic relationship uh, with Russia. Then again, so does Mr. We Mearsheimer. So does Big Brzezinski. So does Henry Kissinger. I would remind you of that. Uh, the Ostauschuss is alive as well, and it is still moaning. Um, and of course, there are people in the Social Democratic Party who think that Ostpolitik is the best thing ever invented since sliced bread, and that is what we should still um, calibrate all our policy by. But the, the reality is also that all of that has been more or less pushed aside. None of this is any longer mainstream. And the mood in the German policy community is one of, I would say, grim determination. It's also not particularly optimistic. What Ang Angela has been saying about the outlook for Minsk, I, I'm, I'm guessing, is shared by many people in Berlin. Um, there, is, uh, there has been, in fact, a public repudiation, repeatedly, of the strategic partnership. Both Merkel and Steinmeier have said that this is not a term that we can apply anymore to our relationship with Russia. And the chairman of the German Federation of Industry has been at pains to say that the position of the Ostausschuss is not representative and that, in fact, the German Federation of Industries supports the sanctions and will continue to do so even though it causes pain, and I mean economic pain, to German companies. Um, finally, I have seen some quite senior, uh, very influential members of the Social Democratic Party in smaller closed-door meetings with Russians, um, and I can only use the term reaming out reaming out very senior Russians, and, and this was right after Crimea, saying, do not think that, that this is going to be, that you can have a relationship with us that is re remotely like business as usual. Do not think that any of us will ever recognize the annexation of Crimea. Do not think that you can go back to what you had before with us. In other words, I would say to you that anybody who, and anybody who says the, re the, the reverse is just, I have to say this, deeply mistaken. The Russians have lost their most important strategic relationship in Europe in the last 12 months. Mm. This is over. They no longer have a strategic relationship with Germany. And that, I would say, is a significant pri price for Putin and Putin's regime to have paid. It also, however, un unfortunately, I think, shows us just how determined the Russian regime is and the price that they are willing to pay. Because this, for them, was key. I mean, for us, it was you know, really, uh, I mean, there is always a condescending element to the, to the strategic partnership. 
the Germans thought that they could, and I'll you know, put this a little bit facetiously, but it, this isn't, it's, it's only a slight caricature. They thought they could lead their hairy country cousins by their paws into the civilization of Europe and the post-Kantian order. That's a calculus that failed. Yeah. Uh, it, the calculus of modernizing German business, modernizing Russian business also failed. This was always strictly downstream, not upstream. Or rather, the Russians wanted to go upstream. There was not much modernization going on downstream. And certainly, there was no political modernization. So, so the German calculus failed as well. But I would say the failure and the cost for Russia is much greater than the failure and the cost for Germany. Um, in reality, what you have, I think, seen from Berlin, but I think also seen from the outside, and a lot of our Eastern, um, a, a lot of Eastern uh, diplomats have confirmed this to me, um, some of whom I, I saw in Munich, um, is that Germany is holding together Europe. And, it's, and let's not forget it's holding together Europe on several counts. It's holding together Europe on the, on the, on the fight about how, how, how much integration we need, which is essentially a fight with Britain. It's holding together Europe on, on the, the issue of the Eurozone, um, I happen to be personally critical of our intransigence with regard to structural reforms in Greece. Um, that said, I think they're necessary. And I, and I do think um, that there is, it might be that I understand that the Treasury is critical of this, but I think the Treasury might also acknowledge that we are actually guaranteeing a hell of a lot of sovereign debt in Europe. Um, so we are playing a responsible role there, if, even if you don't like the ideology behind it. And on the sanctions, um, the, the Germans are vulnerable to sanctions, yes, uh, or to the cost of sanctions, but they are far less vulnerable than other countries. And um, I think the biggest worry for Germany right now is how do we backstop the vulnerability of the, of the Balts, the Poles, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, um, if, this, if this goes on for a longer stretch of time, because the Russians, of course, are in a position to punish those countries economically and um, by using ener energy supplies in ways that they cannot punish Germany, as Germany would feel far less. Um, as you know, public opinion took a little longer to get around to this, to this, to this kind of thinking, but again, here again, the Russians have been very helpful. The downing of MH17 by the separatists and the complete, the callous disregard of Russian, uh, of, of, of pleas of, of pleas to Russia by, by Putin and, and his regime to call back the separatists, to make them at least allow uh, the, the representatives of the deceased and of the airline to search for the remains of, of, of the dead, of the, of, of, the, of the plane downing, to treat the, the remains of the deceased with any kind of respect. That had a massive impact in Germany. In particular, the, the very dignified response of the Dutch, um, who were, um, b as you know, but besides Malaysians, the, the majority of the European passengers on that plane were Dutch. And I think all of Germany was sitting in front of their TVs um, watching the columns of hearses bearing the remains of the Dutch passengers returning back and being given a ceremonial welcome by the Dutch government. Um, and, and conscious, and we were all conscious at the time that, that Moscow was doing absolutely nothing to, to, to support, to apologize, or to draw back uh, the separatists. Uh, so that, I think, was what comprehensively turned around German public opinion. And it's since been reinforced um, by, by the revelations about Russian control and command in eastern Ukraine. The reality is, of course, though, that, that, all, that this is a, that while, while, you know, we may be, as I, or I, I would say, I am relieved that this, all of this is the case. Yeah, that uh, Germany is backstopping the sanctions, is backstopping diplomacy, um, is playing such an important role in the conversations with Putin. The, we are facing, as you said, Mr. Miller, a terrible conundrum, which is that none of us seem to know how to stop Putin and how to stop the Russians from doing what they're doing. And in fact, it is becoming increasingly clear that they are operating under a logic that appears not to be accessible to anything that we would recognize as logic. In fact, um, in fact, I would say that as, as somebody who had before, uh, b you mentioned that I was a, a journalist for 10 years, I started out life reporting in Africa. I started out life reporting in Rwanda, in Eritrea, and uh, uh, later in Bosnia and in Afghanistan. And the, re the, the behavior of, of Putin and, and his circle reminds me terribly of the African guerrilla leaders that I have met who were very good guerrilla leaders, but who completely failed at, at, at preserving and maintaining peace and decent, decent governance in their own countries, and therefore turned back to war. 
my biggest fear is is that what I'm seeing now is something that is very like that. In other words, a government that has checked out of modernization, that is check is trying to check out of globalization, and that thinks it can an, uh, it can operate in splendid isolation in a sort of 19th century imperial paradigm while the rest of the world goes on without it. And I fear that the mistake there, of course, and that is what does differentiate the the, the viewpoint from Berlin, uh, from that in Washington, is that that's not possible. Because even Russians, and certainly Ukrainians, have access to information. It's true that Russians seem to be watching state TV a lot and, and, and not, uh, not tuning into other sources, but at some point they will. And even if they don't, at some point they will conclude that life in Russia is just getting too unpleasant under, cer under the circumstances. And unlike their, their, their parents and grandparents under Stalin and Brezhnev, they, they now have the choice of moving. So. The reality as seen from Berlin, where it feels very much like being in the eye of a storm that is building up not just for the next months, but, a, but the next years and a decade or more. The, the view from Berlin is that what we're seeing now in Ukraine is something that can, wherever Ukraine goes, not have a good outcome for this Russian regime. Because if, if Ukraine miraculously turns out to become like Poland, transforms, becomes what Chancellor Kohl once famously called blühende Landschaft, and that was his projection for East Germany. And even that took a while, as we know. Um, if Ukraine transforms successfully, that then becomes proof that a, a population that uh, is the historic source of, of Russian civilization, uh, sorry, a, a territory that is the historic source of Russian civilization, the Kievan Rus, that has profound and, and very real ties to Russia through culture, history, language, and economics, um, can change its mind can change its mind about where it belongs and can sever itself from, from its own history and its own connections. That is the biggest possible systemic challenge to Russia as we know it. Conversely, if Ukraine goes bad, if Ukraine becomes a failed state, that becomes a massive security risk for the Eastern neighborhood of Europe, for the new members of NATO and the EU, and certainly also for Germany. But it also becomes a massive risk for Russia. And I think even I don't want to I, I don't want to overstate the fragility of, of Russia and of its state of economic affairs. But I think we will see a speeding up of the processes of fragmentation that we're already seeing in Russia, and in particular of capital and um, outflows and the outflow of the Russian middle class. None of which is good news for Russia. So f seen from Berlin, we may we may have a short to medium term outlook of of firmness of of European cohesion. And I think the Germans are aware that they have to play a central role in this. But the long-term outlook is bleak. And I don't think any of us have an answer to that. What I do know is that the kind of grandstanding that we saw in Munich is not helpful in, in, in maintaining transatlantic cohesion for a task that will take us at least a decade to resolve together, if we can. That would be great. Thank you. Yes, great. But we'll nonetheless go on. <laughs> Thank you, Constanza. Um, We'll, we'll turn now to our honored guest, Mustafa, for, for a little bit of reaction to what he's heard, but I want to take the opportunity to remind everyone of the questions from the previous session that we said specifically we would defer, um, and, and I want to add one of my own as well. I love Constanza's term, the, the terrible simplifiers, um, so let me phrase it this way. The question of continuity of sanctions and the shape of sanctions has been raised. The question of following through on the talk about uh, American weapons uh, being sent to Ukraine has also been raised. Uh, and yet we, we do have a ceasefire. We, we have some positive progress, it seems. So, so let me phrase the question this way. Um, is it a terrible simplification to, to define support for Ukraine, as Ambassador Hill um, uh, n named that term? But would it be a terrible simplification to say that support for Ukraine consists of continuity of sanctions, sending weapons, all of these things, anything but that is surrender to Putin? Or is there some other path that Ukrainians are interested in? <laughs> is there some other version at this moment, in particular in recognition, if in fact Minsk represents some progress? Um, and, and let me also ask, is, it, is there a terrible simplification in the eyes of Ukrainians in terms of a binary choice, that it's a European path or it's a Russian path? Or is there, as so many people imagine, some other Ukrainian way? In fact, many Ukrainian leaders have, have tried to define this in the past. Mm. Okay. I'll try to start from a second question, is that do we have some specific Ukrainian way, yeah, or not European or not Russian? 
you know what what Russia want to prove us now even in Davos was that in Munich is that Ukraine should be neutral yes and we had this discussion for 20 years of our history after independence that we should be neutral and then we are forget the next part of this sentence we should be neutral because this is the will of Russia mm. yes we, we, got, we are discussing that. We are forgetting one things. One thing is that we are discussing the question because of Ukrainian want to be neutral or Russia want to be neutral. If we are going to meet the requirements of Russia that we should be neutral, then where is that red line when we stop to fulfill all requirements of Russia? Today it will be f neutrality of Ukraine. And then tomorrow it will be an action of Donbass and uh, other territories. And then they will go to the Transnistria and etc. So let's stop this discussion. That is Ukrainian will. If Ukrainian people would like to be neutral, they will decide it themselves. You can't force them to do that. It will be conflict. You know, it's not like toy. You can't put this toy somewhere and say that you should be there. There are a lot of forces inside the Ukraine who don't want to be neutral. A lot of people who are very radical, you know, that even in our parliament, there are forces who want to be part of NATO, and their demand of our president to announce it openly that we are going to NATO. You know, it's dangerous now, but th we have these forces in our parliament. But the question is that, you for, if you are asking about some specific way of Ukraine saying that we don't want to, we don't uh, should to go to uh, West or Europe and, and stay somewhere in between, my question is that who are going to guarantee that this neutrality will be, will be safe for Ukraine? You're right that we eliminated our nuclear weapon, but now we even can't ask to help us with the little defensive equipment. Just imagine, we agreed to eliminate 1,000 missiles, nuclear missiles. And now, here in Washington, and the United States was guaranteed Ukraine sovereignty and, and integrity, we are discussing, should the United States provide us with some defensive little weapon or not? It's ridiculous. <laughs> yes. And so for me, it's obvious that this is due par parallel processes. And the, the, this the first question, sanctions or weapon? Just imagine that you have your house and someone tried to rob you, but he is not successful. Are you going to hire guard to protect your house? We have the same situation now. Russian tried to invade our territory, to occupy, to attack us, and we stopped them in some meaning. What are we going to do now? Should stop to arm our army? Should stop to develop, develop our army? Or we should have some weapon to prevent these attacks in the future? What is the logic of Russia and why we are playing this game? The Russians' experts' game is that you don't have to give Ukrainians a uh, little weapon because it's dangerous, and then we use something against Ukrainians. But my question is that, okay, let's imagine that we have this little weapon, but we are not going to fire. We just have it. Come on. It doesn't mean Russian to, to attack us. This is Russians' will and options and choice to attack us or not to attack us, to start this war or not to start this war. It's not our will, but we want to protect it. It's our right. So if we have this weapon, this is the, I, I'm sure it will prevent Russia to go further. What we saw last month is all negotiations, every negotiations, Russia see as a weakness. They are not going to deal with us. They are not going to fulfill our requirements. For them, this is our weakness. If we are ready to show them 
our weakness in next months, I mean in next years, come on. But we had this situation in 1939 with Hitler. When they attacked Poland and Gdansk and French elites and government, they didn't involve this process, they didn't protect Poland, and then we had World War II. And was the same discussions. Are we going to die for Dansk or not? Are we going to, in, to be involved in this process and have war in our streets or not? And, Ukraine, and uh, French elites and European elites, they think, okay, we will not be involved. It's not our problem. They will deal themselves. Now we have the same situation. Are we going to repeat this mistake? That's my answer. All right, why don't we open it up to the audience for questions. Just as in the previous panel, we have microphones on both sides of the room. Could I comment? Raise on your the hand. The last point. Sure, yeah. Um, Go ahead, Bill. For at least 15 years, the United States supplied the equipment and training to Ukraine uh, that was necessary for its defense. It's only in the last five years that the military uh, capability was stripped out by the corruption and subversion. Uh, the United States uh, supplied lethal equipment over a period of 15 years and made uh, Ukraine's military force a, a one of the strongest in Europe. And it's only in the last five years that it's disintegrated to this, this, the pitiful state that it's in now. Okay, so questions uh, right there. And so just identify yourself and your institution, please. Michael Dotsenko, U.S. Ukraine Business Council. Um, I actually have two questions, if I may. Uh, first, uh, to uh, mi uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Stelzenmeyer. Um, Miller, sorry. Uh, uh, okay, it's a challenge for a good try. outside of Germany. Uh, we've, we've heard uh, from uh, American companies that work in Russia, um, as well as also work in Ukraine, that now there's uh, a lot of pressure on their offices in Moscow and regional offices, especially after uh, the executive order which was passed by the President of the United States, number 13685, which basically prohibits uh, transactions with Crimea or with persons who are resident in Crimea. Uh, there is a lot of pressure from uh, Russian government now on those companies uh, to start doing business in Crimea when some of them never actually operated, never had business. And they're threatened with all sorts of troubles uh, from the tax uh, police of Russia and so on and so forth. Uh, have you heard anything about uh, German companies uh, that operate in Russia uh, having to invest in Crimea or having to ship products to Crimea or those kind of things? No, the simple answer is no. Um, and I think I, I might have. I mean, I might have had the opportunity to hear about it. I, I doubt it. And I also don't think a German company would just, you know, allow itself to be told by the Russians to go do this. I mean, that's just not the way they work. Well, it's, yeah. that's the same with the US. But yeah. th thank you for the information. Uh, the second one is, um, uh, I'm not certain to whom, it's, it's probably to the whole panel. Um, from the business point of view, uh, stability uh, is very important for investment. Uh, and there are companies uh, in the United States that uh, wanted to invest in Ukraine, actually were thinking about investing during Maidan, uh, and several companies opened offices in Ukraine uh, right after basically the shooting on Maidan. Uh, Hilton Kiev opened in March of last year, despite the fact that you know there were people dying there five blocks away a month before that. Um, if the United States uh, gives uh, lethal weapons to Ukraine, that from the business point of view would be viewed as a deterrent for Russia. Uh, because th 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 that would provide more stability in terms of, uh, you know, Russians are not moving in further because they're afraid of the higher cost. Uh, so if the United States gives lethal weapons to Ukraine, that means business would feel more confident about doing 
uh, business will feel comfortable doing business in, sorry about the, the tautology, uh, doing business in Ukraine, not in the East, not in Crimea, but in, say, Lviv or Rivne or Odessa or Kiev and so on and so forth. Could you comment on that, please? Okay. Any, any one of you or all of you? Thank okay. you. Um, does anyone want to comment on that now? We can also take some more questions. Collect a little bit. Yeah, let's collect some other questions. I saw some other hands up. Yes, right here. <laughs> and um, just keep them up because I'll come to you in a moment. Elliot Sorrell, George Washington University. Uh, thank you very much for, for your overview of uh, a challenging situation. Ambassador Miller, you were uh, unique in the sense that you're referring to a legal framework. In the recent uh, weeks and months, I have not heard anyone really refer to the legal framework or what are the remedies under the existing treaties vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the International Tribunal in The Hague. Uh, what are the options that Ukraine has legally? Are there any options? Great. And um, gentleman right here. Okay. Sir, right here in the, in the sweater, and then we'll do another mm -hmm. round in the back there. Thank you so much. I'm Yasser Al Fakhrani, ICFJ. Uh, concerning the ceasefire agreement uh, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, to what extent do you think that uh, this agreement will deter uh, Putin's continued aggression? And who's guaranteeing all these uh, agreements the already? So the, quest the question is whether uh, Minsk will deter further Russian aggression and who is the, the guarantor of that? The question also about legal remedies available to Ukraine, if we're going to talk about international legal agreements, and then um, the point, if I understood it correctly, that sending weapons may actually be good for business. So who wants to who wants to start on any of this? Uh, well, uh, uh, I think they're, uh, they're cousins. Uh, uh, the questions are cousins. Uh, they're linked. Uh, I don't think anyone contemplated uh, the violations that have occurred. However, they have occurred. And the uh, warning of uh, Gorbachev uh, seems to me to come into play that we have to do something about it. Uh, either uh, restructure the understanding or enforce the understanding. And we're confronted with that uh, challenge. Uh, I was in Vienna recently, and I we were we were discussing the Ukrainian situation, and I said uh, to my Viennese friends, uh, "Anschluss, does that mean anything to you?" And the answer was, "We don't want to hear the word." There's a, a ducking of the issue. It's in front of us. We have to confront it. We have to work out a solution. Obviously, a peaceful solution is desirable uh, and necessary, and we can achieve it. We uh, faced uh, a tremendous challenge in the, in the Cold War and the nuclear arms race, and we were able to solve that by uh, patient diplomacy, and I think that's the only way. Ms. Nelson. <sighs> well, sorry, that wasn't directed at you. It's just, just that we, we've reached a point. I mean, this reminds me, unfortunately, of some of the all-night debates we I used to have as a journalist and, and even later about Bosnia and about Afghanistan and about Kosovo. Um, all important foreign policy questions are by their nature intractable. They all present tragic choices where you don't have good options. I have very, very little hope or expectation of this Minsk II ceasefire because I personally think that uh, Putin cannot be satisfied with Donbass. I think he needs Kiev. I think he needs all of Ukraine. Yes. Um, I can unfortunately also, just to be very clear about this, imagine war with Russia. And I can imagine war with Russia in different ways. I don't know if any of you noticed that on the weekend, on Sunday, um, German security circles, read the German Federal Intelligence Service, BND, were cited in Germany's main Sunday paper as saying that the actual fatality rate in Ukraine was 10 times higher than it is normally said to be, 50,000, not 5,000. 
I have since been trying to follow up on that with my old friends from the international uh, relief organizations. Uh, they are understandably wary of confirming or even discussing this kind of thing, particularly on email. So I can't, I, I can't give you any sense of how realistic that is. A number of people, though, uh, noted that their feeling was that the 5,000 number was distinctly understated. That then, of course, brings us into a different kind of territory where we have to ask ourselves, is this really quite like Bosnia? And if it is quite like Bosnia, why are we not seeing that? In fact, as someone who I, uh, I actually wrote about Bosnia war crimes tribunals mostly. I, I, went, I went there after uh, Dayton, uh, and I was mostly in Central Africa while my colleagues were all uh, in Bosnia. But of course, I saw them all the time, and I read their reporting. And I am struck by the fact how little we are engaging in discussing publicly the humanitarian situation in Ukraine, how little we are doing what used to be called somewhat cynically the numbers game, but that numbers game is significant because the numbers entail, I mean, the numbers then raise questions. And if it is true that the fatality rate and uh, presumably the, uh, the, the rate of, of wounded, uh, displaced, dispossessed in Ukraine is larger than, than we are being told, then we are looking at a very, very grave humanitarian situation where we ought to ask ourselves, why are the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the UN um, High Commissioner for Human Rights not on the ground? And if they are not on the ground, is it because the security situation does not allow them to do so? And if so, why aren't we discussing protecting them? Why not? Because that leads us into Bosnia-type, uh, Kosovo-type uh, debates about no-fly zones, about safe zones, about corridors, about putting, uh, not just supplying defensive weapons, but putting boots on the ground uh, in forms of international key peacekeepers, in which case we have to uh, discuss whether the Russians should be part of that as well or not. Um, in other words, we are, I mean, it is my, no, of course not. But, but look, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you what, what discussions we will have then. And, I, and I've, uh, one, of the, one of the things that has crossed my mind is uh, something that I think I've observed in, in Darfur as well, which is what I've called to myself normative disarmament in the West. In other words, that uh, we resolve these cognitive dissonances by denying that the problem exists, by not engaging in the debate about the numbers and about the consequences. Yeah. I think we may still be pushed to do that. I have a little, the other alternative uh, for war in Europe, of course, is a, is a genuine Article 5 situation rather than the humanitarian intervention framing that I've just described. Um, I still have, have difficulties imagining that Putin would drive things that far, but I wouldn't completely exclude it either. My problem is that I am deeply, deeply ambivalent about arms deliveries. I think it's possible to, to deliver defensive arms to the Ukrainians. I also think that uh, indications are that, that um, Putin's forces are somewhat more stretched uh, than, some, than some people would like to admit that they are. They're clearly scrambling to, to bring other forces to the theater. Uh, these are uh, not all specialized. Uh, they are, some of them are recruits. They're uh, being brought from Kazakhstan and other places. Um, and that indicates a, a level of overstretch on the Russian side. But, but it still begs the question of whether, of whether we would be genuinely equalizing the balance of forces in the theater by, by, by sending Ukrainians arms. And I, and I have grave misgivings about that. And I, people more qualified than I have pointed out in the last two weeks just um, how disastrously American efforts to deliver arms uh, to other uh, scenarios of war in the world have, have fared in recent decades. And I think we have to take that very seriously. And then unless I see somebody really engaging with those arguments and disproving them, I don't think I'm willing to come down on that side. And, I tr and, and trust me, I'm somewhat unusually for Germany, something of a liberal hawk on these things. Yeah. But I do worry. And the other thing I will s I'll, s I'll say to you, Mustafa, is that I think that it would really help U Ukraine's cause if we didn't know, or if we weren't forced to acknowledge that some of the Ukrainian oligarchs have their own, have their own private armies, yeah. um, and that some of those private armies have, have somewhat problematic emblems and flags. Um, and again, I am not accusing all of Ukrainian armed forces of being fascists as the Russians are. I'm, you know, there may be individual fascists running around that doesn't you know, change the fact that this is a society see seeking a westward course and wanting to ally itself with Europe and NATO. And I, for one, am not willing to condone any attempt 
to, to write into Western agreements that we should never give them NATO or EU membership. I don't think that's on the cards right now, but we should also never exclude that. I'm absolutely against that. But I don't think the Ukrainian oligarchs are helping the cause at all uh, with these battalions, and I would like to see that changed. If they, could, if they could find a way of bringing them all under the Ukrainian national flag, slapping Ukrainian emblems on them, and making them modify their behavior somewhat, that would really help the Western argument here. Okay. <clears throat> I'll start from last point about battalions and uh, private armies. Um, I think the situation is not simple, you're right, because when we started this war, government was very weak, mm -hmm. and only those people who are on the ground and in the front line, they can't pay those people to fight. There were a lot of volunteers. Now it looks like they're structured. We have our national forces, I mean, uh, army, and we have National Guard. And among those battalions in National Guard, we have some suspicious elements. It's true. What is dangerous, that those suspicious elements are very success on the front line. Mm. We should recognize it, and it's true that they have some problems, but they're very successful fighting. And this is a big dilemma for our leadership, what to do with them. Mm. There are two theories and two, I would say, points of view what to do with that. First of all, and I'm on this side, just we should monopolize every right to use those forces in one hand. Straight it should forward. be president. Yeah. By constitution, we have only one chief and commander. I mean... It doesn't mean that we should, I don't know, fire them or just do with them, but <coughs> we should restructure this system to bring them all to the forces and national forces and to bring into the chief of commander to r run them from the Kiev, not from the local regions. I think it's only, it's only one answer to this question you answered me, because otherwise we have situation when Difficult, difficult, uh, different political forces, different oligarchs. They are trying to threaten Kiev by those battalions. And as stronger they are become, as higher this threat is. Because, for example, <laughs> it is very, you know, ironic and ridiculous that some battalions there helps our oligarchs which are on team of Mr. Yanukovych were in the past of us, of our country. And, but in the parliament, commanders of those battalions, they're in opposition with those people of Yanukovych. It's tricky, but from one side. From the other side, on the start of this war, they didn't have nothing. They didn't have equipment. They didn't have weapon, nothing. And they were armed by those oligarchs, and they did a lot of things very successful because they protected those territories who can be occupied by terrorists. So my opinion is that it should be very sensitive discussion, maybe not open discussion, between leadership of Ukraine and Europe explaining that the day will uh, when Russia will understand that it's our threat and it's our problem. They will use it. They're already using it. They are already do that, yeah. yes. I will not name those battalions. I will not say those names, of. but we have this problem. Mm. But what is very important, we should understand that, that we don't have to be victims of propaganda and victims of manipulation. The manipulation is next. First of all, we don't have any radical elements in our government. We don't have any elements in our, even in leadership of na our army uh, or National that. Guard. Yes, I mean, uh, and then... I know, that is the propaganda, but let's, let's not even discuss that. No, no, the I mean, the, the question is that if we asking Ukrainians to what not to do that, can I ask, I don't know, French government, do you have officially parties which is more radical than those elements we are talking about in Ukraine? We have official parties in French who are, who are competing 
for to be in government. This is big problem, I know, because you know it's it, Russia used that, sure. and that's our problem that Russia used that. I'm agree that we are in danger, and we should discuss it and we should resolve this problem. Mustafa, let me ask you a, a question. As a member of parliament, there are proposals from the very top of your government now to mass mobilize the country. That might be one mm -hmm. solution to the problem that your manpower mm -hmm. at the moment is heavily concentrated in the volunteer battalions. Well, if you draft a million people, then it won't be. Uh, what do you think about that? And what do you think about this, I think, rather strange remark from the president about martial law? What do you mean? Uh, martial law, military... Uh, the military emergency. Ah, military yes. emergency. Uh, uh, you know, we, we don't. <laughs> it's min misunderstanding about battalions and about regular army. If you see the front line of the, the uh, battle of battlefield, battalions are in two points, two or three points in all line of front line. All amount of all battalions, which you've heard, not more than three or four thousand. The regular army, they are not so, they are not screaming so loud when they have some problems. Yes? Why? Because, you know, this is army. They, the soldier can't call to journalists saying that, you know, we have problem. Battalions can't do that because they are volunteers. One, and the second is that, which is, which I don't like, is that battalions, they're equipped much better than our army. But, in any conflict, in any problem we have, I don't know, some, uh, someone killed or some problems in the front line, battalions blaming army that army didn't support them. This is dangerous because in real life, artillery, now we don't have direct contact of troops. This is tactic war we have now. It's artillery against artillery. So battalions, they're protecting some territory, nothing more. But from outside, it looks like in Ukraine fighting only volunteers. It's not true at all. It's misunderstanding. It's manipulation. And uh, this law about emergency uh, of uh, war state, yes, uh, I don't know. I think this is, and it President explains that it's just, okay, it's just words. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't believe. Idea, trust yes. Me. So, but. From one side, from the other side, politically inside our country, you can't resist. And you, I want the last um, comment is that you told that we have maybe more than five thousand people injured and killed. You know, I'm from Afghanistan. I understand what is the wha what does it mean. It means that if you have five thousand people killed, means that you have fifteen thousand people injured, and you should multiply it on four because we have they have families. So we have almost one hundred thousand people in Ukraine who will ask any government what you are doing. We've lost our people. And it is very hard to stop this process. It is very difficult to save Ukrainian people now that you know we had some political uh, agreement with Russia, and Russia will use those people to destabilize situation in Kyiv. They are doing it now. In Kyiv we have inner information that there are a lot of provocators who are ready to start protests in this spring. Sure. And so we, we don't have to give this ace to Putin. We don't have even to show Putin that we can stop, that say, OK, we've lost Crimea, you occupied Donbass, let's deal. It's impossible because it's impossible for any president of Ukraine, for any government, for any prime minister. People will not deal with this government which if this government will allow Putin to do that. But can I add something onto that? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'm aware that was, was one or two questions that we haven't answered yet, but I think this is worth pursuing. The, uh, I think from a, from a point of view of defending Ukraine, I think in Europe, all of us understand, and certainly the Germans understand, that as Chancellor Merkel herself said, what is happening in Ukraine is a threat to the European security order, and it is in fact a threat to U the European project. We get that. Yeah. We also get that if you have a majority population saying we want to ally ourselves with Europe and with the West, 
you can't just say actually we don't feel like it yeah that's a there it is it this would be in contradiction to our values and the values on which the european project is founded so there is a great deal of sympathy and support um and that is reinforced by the suffering of ordinary ukrainians but there is if there is one single factor that is damaging to that support it is the role of the ukrainian oligarchs because and to you because you come from afghanistan and i cover used to cover afghanistan it, i mean there is a there is an extent to which the ukrainian oligarchs do remind me of afghan warlords mm -hmm. in that you have a very fragile central government that has struggling for legitimacy, struggling indeed for control, struggling for state functionality, whereas you have very wealthy warlords that are trying to dictate to the government you know, what it should do and what it ought not to do, and that essentially operate on their own, own account with their own armies. That's the impression that the oligarchs give. And I think it would be, it would be hugely helpful. I've, I've said this jokingly before, but I'm thinking that this one should no longer joke about this, that it would be nice if the oligarchs banded together, let's say the 10 richest oligarchs in Ukraine paid a revolutionary tax to their government and said, you know what, we will, we will donate 10% of our income um, and we will put all of our private armies under Ukrainian government control. And we will also sign a pledge, you know, that we are we will only be supportive of the Ukrainian government. And in fact, whatever you, whatever corruption there is in our own companies and, and our own activities, we pledge to clean up. You know, that would be in, in terms of a sort of goodwill act uh, towards Europe. That would be incredibly helpful. Okay. Oh, oh, no, <laughs> we we had this idea in the start of cam when we started campaigning. The root of this question is that in uh, Corina Corbina uh, Corina told that is just founding of political system. Yes, we we now try to, I mean, those young people in parliament, we are trying to adopt now to develop and then to adopt new legislation to make pos possible uh, budget funding of political parties, to make clear, to, to unbend politicians from oligarchs. When we uh, propose that to include this option to the uh, coalition agreement, all political parties refused. They don't want to be embedded from, from oligarchs. But what, what is true from about, poli uh, about oligarchs? Actually, mm, we have only one oligarch who has big influence in political system of Ukraine. It's Mr. Kolomoisky, and it's obvious because he is governor and he is quite tough. And But <coughs> I would say that he is dangerous, but he is not biggest threat for Ukrainian democracy and stability. The threat is that our leadership are not ready to stop all of them. What is bad is because there, there is competition between different oligarchs okay. to influence different politicians. So if Mr. Yatsenyuk, Poroshenko, Turchinov, Timoshenko, Avakov, will gather and say, okay, guys, let's stop it. And that will be start of this point. Now we don't have it. What we can do, I think, the, my, my answer, because I'm not sure it's right answer, is to launch this anti-corruption bureau. Yes? Because if, if this agency will be independent, they will start from high-ranked politicians, and all of them are linked to to oligarchs, and we should press them, we should push them to do that. Mm. We don't have any other choice. But unfortunately, we are not in the country in which oligarchs can, <coughs> can say, okay, now we are rabbits and we are just look at your game. <laughs> it's, it's, it, we don't have those <laughs> people. You know? All right, we have uh, just uh, a little over 10 minutes left. So what I suggest is let's take another round of questions from here in the room, and then we can give everyone here a chance we to, to have the final say. Ones, we'll and we know that there are some unanswered questions. So the, the lady right here in the middle, uh, in the kind of striped top, there we got, yeah. Hi, uh, Katria Trushakovic Tomko. I'm a junior at Lafayette College and an intern at the Ukrainian Congress Committee of C America. Can you speak into the mic? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> junior at Lafayette College and an intern at the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, as well as a member of the Ukrainian diaspora. Um, I know we've really focused on the ceasefire and whether or not it's going to hold up. And my question is whether or not we really want it to hold up. 
I understand that right now it's just a band-aid for something that needs sutures, but um, with this ceasefire, you have Ukraine getting regaining its border with Russia, but only after they hold local elections and have uh, pass massive constitutional reforms, which essentially allows Putin to keep power. How is this different from just annexing that section of the country? Because these elections will be in Luhansk and Donetsk. Um, and if it's not, if there's not much of a difference between the annexation and just kind of this a lot like heavy influence in that region. What are we supposed to do? Is it supposed? Is it going to improve? Is it? I mean, if Eastern Ukraine falls, that's the entire manufacturing section of Ukraine. Western Ukraine can't defend with its farmers. Okay. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the striped tie. Thank you, uh, Alex Kuzma with the Ukrainian Catholic Education Foundation. I'm glad Constanza brought up the issue of Bosnia and Rwanda, not that I want to make that analogy, but um, one of the key concepts that's been lacking from uh, this discussion, and it's been an extraordinarily fine discussion, is the G word, which is genocide. Um, Russia has shown that it has a capacity for genocide in terms of what it accomplished in the 1930s with the Holodomor. It showed that it has the capacity for genocide in terms of its enthusiastic support of Serbia during the Bosnian crisis. And it showed that it's willing to obliterate a city like Grozny. So my question is, is this something that um, is beginning to be discussed? Because that definitely changes the calculus if we're going not just from 5,000 to 50,000 deaths, but we're going to a city like Mariupol, which is a city of about 500 to 600,000 people that have shown clearly their willingness to resist Putin. If Putin decides he can't outflank Mariupol but has to do a direct attack on Mariupol, we're looking at a potential Dresden situation that could lead to the deaths of 500,000 people. And then we're looking at something that begins to be defined in terms of genocide. So that definitely changes the calculus in terms of what Europeans and Americans typically respond to uh, when it comes to providing military aid, peacekeepers, no-fly zones, which Constanza had brought up. So is that something that's being discussed? And what would be the response if Russia fulfills, once again, the, the uh, worst-case scenario? Because we've been really bad about right. anticipating the worst-case scenarios. Okay. Thank you. And then last question right here. I'm Bogdan Bano, I'm with the uh, Meridian International Center. Congratulations to Mustafa, I actually had a chance to um, host the Mustafa at Meridian two years ago when he came on a program funded by the U.S. Embassy in Kiev. So congratulations again. Uh, two quick questions. Um, one, if I'm watching Russia TV and I hear you guys talking and I hear the questions, I would think that everybody's completely off the mark. Uh, because the reality that it's portrayed there, it's one vastly different that anybody has mentioned here. And the sad fact is that that's the reality that Russians hear overwhelmingly nowadays. I think uh, one of the sp uh, speakers in the previous pan panel mentioned the fact that uh, there's n more needs to be done to enhance media in Russia and the internet, but even that ge is getting squeezed out. Right. So the, the, the reality that's heard is one very different than one that we heard here in the West. And how can we get Putin to move his stance and get closer to a negotiation stand when the reality back home and the pressure that's put on him, it's the one that portrays Ukraine in the, like the Nazis and all of the other stuff that we hear. So okay. um, anyway, that's, that's my question. So, so uh, I think we have four questions on the table that they come in sort of clusters. The, the question about legal remedies, I think, uh, still needs to be addressed if anyone has thoughts on that. Um, uh, the question about whether uh, Ukraine should want the ceasefire to hold uh, and whether the, 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 the big difference between this agreement and, and September, which is the sequencing question, uh, is, is problematic for Ukraine. And then I think actually this uh, media question and uh, the question about genocide in a sense are in the same basket, which is these are, these are Manichaean interpretations of the situation. Uh, the World War II analogies, genocide, sort of absolute evil, uh, kinds of questions, and and I would I would pose in general your reaction to those 
statements, but also I would I would add the fine finer point here, which is if in fact any of those interpretations are at least remotely relevant or valid here, where does this end, right? If we define this conflict as the new World War II or the World War III, as so many people are saying, and bear in mind, Russia is a nuclear power, and we are living in a different era. Where do we anticipate that this ends? That's terrifying to me. Um, who wants to go first on, on any of the easy <laughs> questions? <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, uh, we have to agree on uh, the legal framework, uh, the uh, world order, that <coughs> we're willing, as all nations, Ru Russia included, to live under the principles of uh, Helsinki Final Act, uh, the basket of 10 principles uh, of human rights, security, and economic development. Uh, do they still apply? Th does the Decalogue uh, still have relevance? That's what we should be talking about. And uh, we'll come to uh, uh, in the end, uh, an agreement on uh, basic principles and uh, will uh, provide a graceful way for Russia to r remove itself from Crimea as we have done in the past and uh, from eastern Ukraine and uh, uh, continue as uh, civilized people rather than uh, the, the uncivilized uh, barbarism that we're witnessing at the moment. Okay, I'm actually an international lawyer by training. Mm. Um, that is why I was covering war, tri war crimes tribunals and in fact also the conference for the creation of the International Criminal Court. Um, and I have to tell you, I cannot follow you on your suggestion that we view this as a genocide in the making. Uh, and it's precisely because I am an international lawyer that I can't follow you. I think, in fact, Kosovo was misframed as attempted genocide. It was a mass violation, a grave, severe, heinous violation of human rights, but it was not a genocide. And if we, if we don't want to stretch the, ge the rules of the, and the applicability of the Genocide Convention beyond all recognition, we ought to be very careful with this term. There is nothing on the ground right now that indicates that there is a genocide or a genocide in preparation. If that changes, I will be the first to say so. But I am, I am very careful about this because I think that you, if you use this word, to, this term too loosely, you debase the concept of you know, what is the most serious and the, the worst kind of crime that man can co commit against man. And I say this as a German and deliberately. You know, I am fully conscious of the heritage of my country in this point. Um, that brings me to the next point. Is there any other kind of legal framing that is useful to deal with the situation on hand? The Helsinki Final Act doesn't provide for enforcement. Almost no legal treaties uh, of, of the security and, uh, treaties in Europe provide for any kind of legal enforceability. Mm -hmm. That is the nature of the order. Um, it was these, the, they, the if <coughs> disputes were left to diplomatic resolution. And as we know, um, to use the old Shakespearean chestnut, um, very often they were honored more often in the breach than in the observance. Um, I am, now that we have the International Criminal Court, it would be a little easier to bring what is occurring now in Ukraine under the purview of the ICC. But it's not going to change anything on the ground and certainly not deterring anybody. So I think right now this is, it, it isn't high on my list of things to, to, to worry about because I think the things that we ought to worry about are much more important and much more urgent. Which is not to say that, you know, somewhere down the end of the line um, that's something we should exclude. Um, yeah, annexation of Eastern Ukraine, you know, I think that that's a possibility. It's not what is happening right now. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not, I'm not excluding that it would happen. Again, uh, I think all of us, I mean, I, I think you must have understood by now that I'm not neutral on this one. Yeah, I also don't think that neutral, neutrality is a possibility in this conflict. Yeah, there it's very clear who is the aggressor here, even if the Azov b battalion is marching around there and wearing problematic badges and flags. Um, but I think also we have to be, we have to be extra careful in the terminology that we use and the vocabulary that we use because all we are doing, if we don't, is to give excuses to the Russians and to their propagandists, and we should not let them do that. Um, 
a different reality on Russian TV. You know, it, this is frankly a mystery to me. I'm old enough to have memories of the Cold War. I'm 52 years old. I was born in the year the war was called off. I was 27 when it came down, and I didn't, I mean, I did not expect that to happen in my lifetime. But I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm also used to an atmosphere where we, you know, even in West Germany, we knew about the famous jokes, you know, from Radio Yerevan. We knew that the Russian dissident community was famous for its vicious humor, uh, the jokes told about the leadership. Um, and any of you who have ever read the surveys of the Levada Institute know exactly what Russians think of their leadership. Um, it's not exactly complimentary. In fact, it is deeply, deeply cynical. And so it's a mystery to me why Russian civil society currently appears to be so in step with its, uh, with its leadership. I'll remind you that when, when the West, when NATO uh, started bombing Kosovo, all the Serbian dissidents fell in line with Milosevic, you know, including the dissident communities in Nish and, uh, and elsewhere. This unfortunately is one of the, the sad uh, results of this kind of external pressure. It binds people together and we've seen it happen in Iran as well. That's not to say that this is immutable, but I think at this point we should stop worrying about what the Russians think and what the Russian regime thinks and think more about ourselves. In other words, we should make, uh, again, we should, we, should, we should do several things. We should make absolutely sure we don't overstate our claims, we don't overstate what, what are complex problems. We, don't, we shouldn't simplify them. You know, we shouldn't create black and white where there is a great deal of gray. We should not run into, we, we should not let the perfect be the enemy of the good in the policy proposals that we make. Yeah. We should, as I've been saying, I think I've, I'm very reluctant to, 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 uh, to acquiesce in, in arms deliveries to Ukraine because of the problems that I see. But I think then we also need to take responsibility for what's, what's happening there and, and, and help the Ukrainians in other ways, and I'm not seeing enough of that done. Um, I'll leave it at that. Mustafa, you have the final word. Okay, <coughs> I'll start from legal remedies. I think we should recognize that there is no legal remedies. Yeah. Just because we have with not deal with small country, which we can force to do something, we has deal with big country with nuclear power. And they will break any agreement you 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 sign with them. What is remedy? I think it's just punishing, not now, but in long term. The sanctions, and what should be very clear is that we will not accept an actions which we had in Crimea. We should recognize it was an action. We should admit that we are not going to accept people was killed in this MH17. There are a lot of obvious evidence of crimes. And we should say that we are not going to accept and we are going to punish for that. It could be economically, military, or etc. But that's the start point of building new base for some legal remedies in the future, because now we don't have them. It's obvious. About ceasefire and an action of uh, east part of Ukraine. You're right that it's not an action now, but an action of Crimea starts the same way. Okay. That's why for us it's just start, it's the first stage, first step toward that, that process. That's why we are going to say that this country, they're aggressors and they're occupied our territory. And what is obvious for us that our border is transparent for them. And Legally, they are not annexed, those territory. But in real life, they don't have problem with to, to access to our territory, to use this territory, and even to use this territory to attack us. So formally, they annexed formally. I mean, this territory are used by other government but of other country. That's reality. But... As far as this is reality, we can't say that, okay, we should fire them and we kill them and we don't need ceasefire. It is very hard to say that we don't need ceasefire if you see that people are dying. I was in front line, first days of war, 
and first days of first ceasefire. It was last summer. People on the ground and those who are in the front line, soldiers, they were angry that Poroshenko has agreement with those people who, uh, with the, with the uh, terrorists or okay, separatists, and they announced the ceasefire. But when you came back to Kiev and see eyes of those mothers, wives, and children, they are happy about this ceasefire. Mm. Because it, this is a guarantee for them that no one will die at least five days. That it, it's not reason to, to make, I don't know, long-term ceasefire forever. But sometime we need this ceasefire. We need, we need it th last time because last time during this ceasefire we get stronger and we were able to protect our territory because you know that during our presidential election we control much less territory than during parliament election. It was achievement of our military troops. It th and the reason was this fire. So I would say that let's be re realists. We are not living more in the world when we don't have Russian troops, we don't, ha don't have those corps, and etc. In real life, sometime you should be, okay, tolerant to our politicians who are doing these deals. But with the support of international society, we should admit that we are not accept this situation forever. And last, it's about interpretation, and I will finish with that. You know, now we have war in Ukraine, and in your mind, in imagination of all people of the world, this conflict is very, you know, in one point of world, in one point of map. But <coughs> it regards a border and physically of this land. But there are another war which is in your home every day, is information and media. And you are, I mean, not you as you, but United States and Europe, you are victims of this war already. Because even now, in Washington, I hear questions like, is it true that fascists did Maidan? Or I'm, I, I heard something like, okay, is it true that Poroshenko ordered to kill people in Mariupol and then it was answer of Russian troops? Listen, it's, it's very dangerous because what they are doing, they are using the tools and achievement of democracy against democracy. Freedom election, free elections, yes. Freedom of media, freedom of speech. They are in our houses all around the world. It's not about Ukraine. Ukraine is first step. Because the first time in our history we can, we, we can't find what is true and what is not true. Russia today is in every hotel in the, in the capital of the United States. Not Ukrainian television, not Arabic television, not Spanish or German, but Russia today for free. You can use it every day with the alternative reality. They don't need reality. You know that what, what, what is very simple for them. M me and you, and you now as a journalist, when you're going to somewhere, you should find information. It is very hard to find information to show some evidence of troops or something like that. And it's much more easier if you don't need this evidence and you have the picture you should show. You can do it from your house, even not going to the front line. That's why Russian media will win all other media if we are not going to protect us. I know it's not democratic, but for example, in our country, we decided that we will cut off Russian media from our audience. As a journalist, I don't like it. But I understand that we don't have other choice. We should provide new system of protection of democracy because we don't have answers to this challenge now. Not Ukraine, all over the world. <coughs> Everyone except that Crimea was annexed, but we don't hear answer what to do. Uh, the same things we have in media, the same thing we have with the referendum, so-called referendum. 
Next day, you know, when Minister of Foreign Affairs of big country with nuclear power saying that reuniting of Germany, it was, you know, illegal because there were no Munich. referendum. Yes. Come on. It's not, not it's not crazy member of parliament. It's Minister of Foreign Affairs officially statement. Can you imagine what plans can they have? They're living in other reality. And it, it's very ridiculous for us. But tomorrow they will go to your home and ask you, are you ready? It's your home? Are, are, you, are you sure? Do you have referendum that this is your flat? <laughs> You're smiling, but when you see guns on your border, you should do something. So it's not only Ukrainian problem. Let's protect us. Thank you. So, so I'm very grateful to, to Mustafa and, and all of our panelists. Uh, let me remind you that we will have uh, the award ceremony now and a reception right here on the sixth floor in the boardroom. So please join us just across the hallway.